thanks to everyone for joining us tonight on our next uh, Northumberland FA coach development event. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, the webinar will be recorded tonight, um, so just to make you all aware of it. And if everyone can please keep the microphones and cameras on uh, mute and uh, switched off, please. It makes the reception uh, a lot better. Um, and if every, anyone's got any questions that they want to ask uh, as the uh, Graham's running through the, the presentation, um, please put them in the chat. Um, if we can get through uh, any questions that come through on the chat, we will do. Uh, but I must say a big thank you to everyone that's uh, sent in the questions. We've got a lot to get through uh, in 90 minutes, and that's if we get through them all. Um, so just a quick introduction. Um, myself, Gary Middleton, Football Development Officer in Northumberland FA. Uh, we've got Helen Beals, who's our Communications Officer, who's in the background tonight dealing with the chat and any issues we may ha have, but hopefully will not. Um, and obviously, Graham Jones, uh, Bournemouth First Team Coach, uh, giving up his time tonight um, to be with us. Um, I'd just like to say thank you for that, Graham. Uh, very much appreciated in the uh, in the international break. It's a pleasure, Gary. Thanks, Graham. A um, little bit about the format. Um, as I say, we've got lots of questions to get through. Um, we're going to talk about Graham's journey. Um, from sort of his his playing career into his into his coaching career, and um, his work with Roberto Martinez, um, moving into working with the Belgium um, first team squad with Roberto Martinez, um, number one in the world, uh, which be, will be a fantastic insight. Uh, into where he is now. Um, so lots to get through. Graham, if you just want to uh, just tell everyone sort of where you started in your uh, your career as a footballer, and you you had a you had a fantastic career as a player, um, not at the very top end, but a one there where you made a living, uh, and then sort of into your into your journey as a, as a manager as such and a coach, please. Um, well, a bit like you, Gary, I started my uh, existence at Millwall Football Club. Uh, took an apprenticeship there in 1986 when I was 16. Um, I'm sure you'll support it and say that it's it's probably the most unique club still that I've been at. It, it takes a certain type to understand that club and the philosophy of that club. So um, I failed miserably. <laughs> Gary is the truth. So, a bit too young, a bit too uh, naive, a bit too um, immature. When I went down to London at 16, got released at 18, played non league football for uh, Newcastle Blue Star, North Shields, all with Colin Richardson uh, and um, Bridlington Town. And then the owner of Bridlington Town bought Doncaster Rovers, and um, I got my opportunity there. He he took me and uh, uh, my best friend, a lad called Chris Swales. He took he took the two of us on on trial, and we both managed to secure contracts. And then three year at Doncaster, four year at Wigan, three year at St Johnson, and then I think I was about 33, 32 when I left St Johnson. I sort of became a bit of a journeyman and went to Southend United, Boston United in League in League Two, Bury. Uh, Clyde and finished at Hamilton Ackies when I was 36. Um, so that's just a quick overview of my career, football career, uh, Gary. Um, it was nothing special, but it certainly satisfied me in terms of mm -hmm. that 18-year-old that got released. You never think you're going to play a league game. And I managed to, to th play 300 plus and scored over 100 goals. So incredibly uh, satisfying from my own personal point of view but I remember getting back in at 23 and thinking right I'm not going back out so I did my A license at 29 um, at Lillishaw the old 16 days at Lillishaw I qualified as a teacher I got a 
Uh, I've got a certificate in education post-16. Um, I try to do as much as I possibly could to make sure that uh, when I finished playing, uh, I was going to be able to stay in the game in a coaching capacity and management capacity. Um, so a lot of voluntary work, but my first real part-time job was at Middlesbrough Academy in 2003. I was I was playing for Boston United, managed to do it two nights a week in a uh, and a Sunday for the under 14s uh, with Stan Nixon and, and, and Dave Parnaby, uh, which was an incredible time to be at that football club. Uh, a lot of homegrown talent and won the FA Youth Cup. And it was a real, uh, uh, there was a quality about the academy Dave and Stan were running there, uh, real education. And then my last club. Uh, Hamel Naki's offered me assistant manager's job uh, maybe three months after I retired I went back and then obviously the rest uh, I was there maybe nine months and Roberto asked me to come to Swansea with him and the rest you know the rest uh, history from my point of view and that's really interesting Graham because you mentioned volunteering you mentioned doing the hours uh a lot of the coaches that you that you speak to, even in the professional game, um, you know the importance of doing that time to gain that knowledge and that experience. Um, it obviously helped you to get to where you are now in the professional game. Um, it, Gary, it, it did, you know, but obviously <clears throat> I feel privileged tonight to speak to uh, Northumberland FA. Um, I remember. Um, being released by Millwall at 18, coming home and not having a clue what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Wanted a coach. So my first job was, um, I was working for Jeff Clark at Newcastle United Football in the community. I was getting me dole money plus a tenner on the old ET scheme, I think it was. <laughs> and all I was doing it for was to 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 get some experience and, and hopefully pass me prelim license. Now, Unless I'm mistaken, I think Bonnie Jones took it um, way back in 1989. Um, and um, I was around the right people, good influences. So that career path really started um, way back in, in 1989 and Northumberland FA were at the centre of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was there any big coaching influences within your coaching pathway? That uh, you know, you role models uh, that supported, supported and helped you along the way there. Uh, I signed for Wigan when I was 26, Gary, and uh, John Dean was the manager. And uh, John Dean had worked under uh, John Lyle at uh, Ipswich for a long time, and um, they were part of that. Ron Greenwood, um, Sir Alf Ramsey, West Ham School. So I've got to say to you that. The first time I got coached correctly about the ins and outs of the game was when I was 26. And, and John Dean was a massive influence on uh, on how I wanted the game to be played as a coach. Um, it was no coincidence that I had me the most successful spell of my career playing under him. Um, and uh, he just... Um, he wanted to control the game with the ball. He was from that school, and he was a he was a he was a he was a role model for me at that time. I suppose what 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 did the practices what did it what did it look like under John then at, at that time as well, a player from a player's point of view? Gary, remember I'd been non-league, yeah? so five <laughs> years in survival, and then I was playing for Doncaster Rovers for three years. And I was just trying to forge some sort of reputation. And I was a, I was a, I wasn't quick enough to be a second striker, even though I was mobile-ish. So I ended up becoming a target man. And at that time, any, uh, I think it gave everybody in the team. When you've got a target man, it gives everybody in the team an opportunity to take no responsibility, especially when they're losing, and just shell the ball forward here. So it was, it was like a boxing match most weeks. And John Dean introduced a a completely different style of play. I mean, we're talking about 1996 in League Two and we're playing out from the back. We're playing different shapes and he wouldn't let he wouldn't allow you to play overhead height and training and um, 
different patterns, different patterns of play you'd work at. And this for me was was incredible, and uh, it was somebody teaching me that or showing me that I had more than just uh, to be a, a you know a, a target for for direct football. So it was um, it was really re- I was really I felt educated by that for the first mm-hmm. time, obviously, but not dismissing the experiences that I'd got before because guys, as you know, you have to fight and you have to um, fight your corner and you have to challenge for first balls and second balls. It's when you put that package together. I think that's when I realised that it was uh, quite powerful. And I suppose looking at the the next question is around Roberto yeah. uh, and that photograph um on the slide there with you and him um can you just describe to everyone i believe you had 13 years working alongside roberto yeah what 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 your relationship was like with him um and how that how that developed you as a as a coach as an individual um well i first met roberto in 1996 when i signed for wigan he was a player here he'd been here a year and one day, John Dean in training just said, pick a pawn in it, stretch your calves off. So me and Rob just picked each other. And I don't know, it just clicked. Clicked on a, on a moral level. He's, he's from, uh, uh, from Catalonia. I'm from the Northeast. You know, like, you're talking about guys from a, a football education point of view, light years apart. Um, in Spain, they get a, a proper technical and tactical football education I was as more physical and with a heart and we just we just connected we connected on the pitch um he had a he had a forward pass in him um I got a lot of goals in my first season and he made most of them so we just clicked as people um we we played together for four years and then I obviously moved on and then I was his first signing when he took the Swansea job he was 33 player manager um, and basically stopped playing overnight. He was playing for Chester in League Two. He'd been at Swansea six months earlier, a really successful spell as a, as a player at Swansea, and they wanted him to come back as manager. And within a week, he'd employed me as his number two. And uh, working relationship, Gary, you're talking about meeting somebody at that age who was... Uh, didn't have a licence to his name, was tactically incredible. Um, had had any summers had gone to watch uh, Rigo Saki work regular. Um, so you had uh, you had again two totally different educations, um, but wanted the game played the same way because of our time together at Wigan. And um, Rob was he was ready for it at thirty three year old, and really incredibly ready and. Uh, it sort of suited his character. I would, uh, he would, he would be, he would be the creative one, and I would be the one that have to dig one or two out and give him a bit of British and and good the balance. Cop, bad cop, Graham. Yeah, a good little cop, bit bad that cop, time. Yeah. yeah, a little bit that time, Gary. But we were, I was very creative as well. Um, so the whole thing just worked. Um, and if he ever lost his temper, then I would go a different in a different direction. Mm-hmm. It just, I think it, it helps Gary when you had that history with each other and you knew each other so well. It was a luck sometimes, and we knew we knew how to uh, how to affect a dressing room. And uh, still around Rob, then um, did his philosophy change over the years? Um, and how, when he went into, obviously, Swansea, uh, Everton, Wigan, how did did that philosophy change from academy up over? Um, I don't think, I don't think, uh, I don't think our philosophy has changed. Remember, Gary, we learned together, right? so I, I learned an awful lot from Rob, but he learned things from me about English football and. We learn together, we learn on the job together. I don't think our philosophy 
for example, very, very similar beliefs, has changed at all through the years. We still want to control the game with the ball. We still want to control the game without the ball, if you possibly can. I think experiences, uh, experiences that you you get along the way, good and bad, you keep. And um, I think that's what makes you a better coach. You actually have to suffer in many, many ways. And it didn't change when I think back at our time at, at Swansea. Um, we managed to cement the style of play at Swansea uh, and consolidated that really in League One, took that into the Championship. And it was that powerful. It served Swansea in good stead under three or four different managers for 10 years and established them in the Premier League. We went to Wigan. It was more difficult to establish that at that level, uh, working exactly the same way. It was difficult to establish it because I think sometimes for players to believe it, you have to have success. So if you're building through the leagues, the more on board where you're taking some wax to the chin in the Premier League when you're, you're trying to play out from the back at that time, um, you're trying to dominate a game at Arsenal away with possession, at, as Wigan Athletic with, you know, it, it's it's not easy. At Everton, I think, uh, I look back, it was, it was the same. We tweaked things along the way, obviously, because your personnel uh, picks shapes, picks, picks tactics, but doesn't pick style of play. Style of, style of play was something that we were really, really proud of, something that we had great knowledge in. And then, obviously, we took the Belgium job, which... Our style of play is very easy to uh, to sort of influence because of the quality of player that we work with. So I would say that experience, more than anything, uh, sort of uh, enriches you. Mm. But the, the the style of play, the principles of play, didn't change really. From I, I watched Belgium England on was it Sunday night, and I can still see the same principles from. Our time at Swansea, we just Rob's just doing it with a back three now. Hmm. And we'll, we'll come to we'll come to Belgium shortly. Um, just where you are at the minute. So, first team coach at Bournemouth under Jason. Yeah. Um, how has the season started uh, for you? Um, what's that environment like at the club? Uh, and the type of players that you've got there. Because I think it was a difficult time in the summer where you've you've lost a lot and you've probably had to build something and, and bring new players in. Yeah, we, we lost 10 players in the summer, Gary, with obviously the situation um, getting relegated. Uh, it's the second time that I've been involved in a, a, a recently relegated Premier League club. Um, first time was two years ago with West Brom. Um Went to a football club in the first time I've been first team coach. So that was new, quite refreshing, actually. Um, went, we'd been playing, the clubs I've been involved with, we've been playing Bournemouth right through the years. So got a pleasant surprise when I went there. It's a proper Premier League club, excuse me, and a really, really good place to live uh, and work. Um, the, the level of player that we've got there is... It's well. I think it's very, very good. Um, you've got the likes of Josh King and Dominic Solanke, um, Honor Dan Juma, really, you know, arguably Premier League footballers. Um, but of course, these people need managing. It's not just as simple as oh, you're above the level and let's turn up and beat everybody every week. It's there's no such thing. You need to manage these people. You need to stimulate stimulate these people if they don't stimulate themselves. Um, we started the season, I think we've played 11 games. Uh, we were unbeaten until the 9th or the 10th. I think we lost to Sheffield Wednesday away a night that they had a win. It was it was a, it was a difficult game. So we've been beaten once, very satisfactory. I would like to think if we, we play Reading on Saturday, if we, if we manage to beat Reading and haven't looked at them in the last sort of four or five days, it uh, won't be an easy game. There's no such thing, but they've got they're capable. If we if we do manage to get three points, we'll be probably be in the top two, which is where we want to be. And what does a typical training day look like, um, especially in the championship when it's normally week on week, two games a week? 
does that look like for you down at Bournemouth? Well, Saturday to Saturday is very different, Gary. Saturday to Saturday, Jason, Jason, the first time, he likes to give everybody Sunday and Monday off and give them a, a proper mental break. And then we work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, play Saturday. It's the first time I've ever worked like that. Uh, we normally used to give, and when I was manager, and give people a Wednesday off, sometimes a Thursday. Um, and it's been, it's been a different way of working, and I quite like it. Um, it allows you to work that extra day physically and tactically, so your preparation's better. Um, a normal, a normal working week would be that. Obviously, I'm in there at seven thirty every morning. Coaches meeting. Myself, Jay, Stephen uh, Purchase, um, sports scientist Dan Hodges. We're, we're in there basically speaking about thoughts and requirements of the day. Then we'll, we'll definitely have an element of, of tactics within every session. Um, some days more than others, there's a, there's a greater physical requirement. And then, um, you know, depending on the physical needs, we'll pitch that towards the uh, front part of the week different to what we do to the, the back end of the week where you're looking to try and peak physically um, and that's that would be a normal working week if you're talking about the period we've just had which I think has been s- seven games in, in three and a bit weeks so we've been playing every midweek that's been difficult um, I think in that in a three week period we had three days where we could actually work tactically on the training ground so you, you're relying heavily on analysis Mm-hmm. Analysis of the opposition, analysis of your games, a lot of walkthroughs. Um, so this season's it's a unique season. We start again on Saturday, as I've said, against Reading. I think we've got a uh, we've got nine games in just under five weeks. So I've not I've never known a schedule like it, but it, it, mm-hmm. it's how it is. So you you have to adapt, Gary, which is the for me is the biggest word in football. You need to- <laughs> I suppose, Graham, from a from a coach's point of view, it, that that'll be quite frustrating, will it? Where you kind of get out in the grass to to practice uh, something that needs to be improved for the opposition that you're playing on the Tuesday night or the following Saturday, is it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I love the grass, Gary. It's it's what you miss when you're not working. Um, I love coaching, so I love trying to find remedies and solutions. That's that's the beauty of the job, you know. So that that is, but you analysis is so huge in the game now. You have to roll with the times. If you mm-hmm. can't work on the training ground, then you need to work in the the meeting room, and that's where we found ourselves a lot with different unit meetings and team meetings and individual meetings. And you can make progress as well. Graham, my next question is sort of just a general around the audience that we've got tonight, and. Uh... This has been brought up on a, on, a, on a few discussions with me of late. Um, coaching in pairs. Um, I got someone on. Was on, I was on a presentation on on uh, Sunday, and uh, he called it gang coaching. So, over your career as a coach, you've worked with other coaches and managers out in the out in the pitch. How do, how has that worked with you and, and Rob? As in, who takes what part of the session? Who's observing? Are you working together? Is is one of you working with the the, the, the back six? The other one working on the on the on the front six? Um, yeah, how has that worked for you in, in in your career to date? Gary, I'm at a club now where we're blessed with a number of coaches. So uh, there's Jason, there's Stephen, there's myself. And then we've got coaches underwear, and it's the first time I've ever ever coached that way. It's been quite interesting, actually. Um, for the last twelve or thirteen years, however long me and Rob worked together, it was just me and him, and me and him took everything. So if we had to split the groups up, he would he would take the defenders, say I would take the attackers and the midfield players. When we needed to, um, when we needed to reduce the sessions in terms of numbers. And then when we came together, I, I would lead certain things. He would lead certain things. It's Sometimes it's where you are in the season. It's what type of character that's needed in terms of your demands and your drives and, and, and how you're trying to get a result for the weekend. And I, I think I think that's working in pairs. That's a partnership. Mm-hmm. 
my partnership with Darren Moore, for example, I went to West Brom. Darren was Darren was a well capable coach. Um, Darren, I was me and Darren roomed together in uh, nineteen ninety nine, doing my air license. And Darren was 25, I was 29, so he's more than capable. But at that time, with a relegated club, he felt he needed to manage. So he was managing players and recruiting players, and I took everything at West Brom. And that worked in a completely different way because the needs of that situation was that as such at that time. So I think if you, you're talking about pairs, the, the situation really dictates it, but you have to be flexible enough in order to play every role. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Graham. Um, we, we speak a lot about in football environments and creating that right environment for it to be successful. Um, what would you say about you know your environment that you've had to create with Jason, uh, with a new group of players, is like at Bournemouth? Um, did you have that environment at Everton? Uh, and I suppose. When you're at Wigan and you won the FA Cup, you know the type of environment you had in that dressing room and out on the training pitch. Because, because, for for me, it's everyone talks about the environment, but what what do you need to do to create that environment? Whether you're working in the pro game or you're working in the grassroots game. Well, the one thing I would say, Gary, is a perfect situation doesn't exist, and we all work towards it, but it doesn't exist. It wasn't it wasn't perfect at any of them clubs. And there's always there's always somebody who's not happy because they're not playing or they're out there eighteen or whatever it is. So I think you have to you, you have you have to manage that. That that's your job, you know. I think if you never go away from being honest, no matter what level of player you work with, you'll never go far wrong. I think experience brings consistency within that honesty, and um, normally. If you you you've got them qualities about you, your environment, more often than not, it's going to be uh, more positive than negative. Next question, Graham. Um, I'm not sure if you've mentioned this already because I, I think you've you sort of mentioned about the philosophy, but um, have you? Have you had to change or did you change training methods, styles, game plans for the championship level opposed to how you played in the Premier League with with Everton? Um, did, did I? Has anything changed there? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to... Um, you have to pitch it to the audience, Gary. So, uh, believe me, if you give... If you give Kevin De Bruyne information uh, in a game, he's took it on board and can deliver it in no time. And that's not the same for other players that you're working with. So what happens is you have to change, you have to pitch it, you have to change the level of information, the level of intelligence of that information, because not everybody's capable. I found that quite frustrating at times. Because you you're talking here, and and certain people can't they can't grasp that. That's not their fault. It's my fault. Because you you're treating everybody in that category. They're not elite. There's the, the elite players can believe me. They are super intelligent as well as incredible capacity physically, technically, uh, mentally, tactically. The, these boys can take information on. So you, you, you learn to pitch it. Again, Gary comes with experience because you can shoot yourself in the foot, pitching pitching a little bit too high for people that are struggling. So that's been interesting, especially in the last few years since I left Belgium, because obviously I've worked championship, different challenges at them championship clubs with West Brom, with Luton, and with with Bournemouth. So, but again, that that helps. That, for me, that helps you develop as a coach. That's mm-hmm. part of it, and. Uh, it's been good for that. And I suppose that comes down to knowing your players, doesn't it? Well, that's what it is. Um, and knowing, yeah. knowing the ones that are capable and knowing, knowing yeah. what, what level of information they give and what not they give. It's that, That's a big thing as a coach. Yeah? We all want to get 
our concerns off with chess. Be careful with him on set plays. Make sure you cover the space. He's str- but sometimes, psychologically, that can finish somebody off before you even go out. So the psychological aspect is so important that you understand that and you understand the character. So it takes a lot of work to get to that, that kind of level. And I don't think any of us are perfect, but again, experience helps you. And, and I suppose uh, not overcomplicating the information that you're giving out at whatever level you're working at, would I be right in saying? Yeah, yes, but the top lads want it complicated. Right. They need stimulated. The, 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 you, you need, they want it they want it as intelligently as you can give it to them because they're capable. And if not, they stand still and they're not stimulated by mm-hmm. you. So it's different audiences need it pitched completely differently, Gary, you know? Mm-hmm. And I suppose the, the next one, um, in percentages-wise, and, and I think you can use your, your looting experience here as well, Graham, into a, into a normal day, um, what sort of percentage would you be looking at it planning, uh, actually delivering, and, and ultimately talking to players, yeah. um, which is probably a different formulation as an assistant <clears throat> to being the, the main man? Uh, I think um, that is the skill. You realise, uh, I was a looking manager for a year, you realise in the, uh, with it, after a period of time that there's days to manage and there's days to coach. Now, uh, I find that difficult when my answer has always been coaching. So it took me a while to get that. I think if you're talking about, for example, Luton, my preparation time, my analysis time was, Gary, I'm telling you, I'm telling you no lies. Uh, every Saturday night after a game, I needed to find answers. Won't win, win, lose a draw. I would, I would watch our game for four hours. I'd get up the next day on a Sunday and I'd watch the opposition for four hours. And that's how long it takes to properly analyse a game. Then I felt going into work on Monday morning, I was equipped. I had all the information. Now, then you're planning a session. Believe me, I go into detail. Them sessions, I was starting at 11 o'clock. I was in at half seven. So it can last three hours before you actually deliver an hour and 10 minute or an hour and a half session. That's the reality of it. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about, I don't know, 12 hours, 12 hours preparation before you deliver an hour and a half session. Most weeks. And, and by the end of my time at Luton, I was watching the opposition four and five times because I wanted to know everything. And... um. That's the reality of coaching. and that's the way the game's gone. The modern game's moved so quickly with analysis. I remember at Swansea with Roberto, there was no analysis. And then we got promoted the championship and he was watching one game a week during his dinner hour to, to find out more about the opposition. This is 2008. So I think about how much it's changed, the analysis uh, aspect of the games it's took coaching and management to a completely different level and is that that work that you put in is that is that helped you in your career huge yeah. remember i didn't i didn't i used to watch when i was assistant i used to watch us and watch the opposition once because mm-hmm. i needed to have a knowledge of what was going on i didn't watch it in the same kind of detail i did as a manager because everything rests on you Everything. But there's a there's a saying in the gym in Bournemouth that says the tougher the climb, the better the view. And I totally, totally understand that saying. Mm-hmm. And that would apply to certainly the last few years where it's been it's been uh, burning your brain and trying to come up with different ideas and ways of winning football matches when you uh, you, you haven't got the Belgium national team's quality to rely on at times. So it's been really educational in the last the last two and a half, three years for me. Graham, it's it's really interesting what you're saying there. Well, I did I did one of these um, a few months ago with um, Ben Dawson from Newcastle United and Neil Winskill and 
one of the, the the main features that came out from that was the miles that you need to put in to get to the very top um, is unbelievable. And, and, you know, again, coming from you, um, coaching at the highest level, um, the work that you, you're you putting in season on season uh, to try and be successful. Yeah. Well, Gary, i never seen it that way. Um, I think, I've got to be honest with you, I, I decided a long, long time ago to live for the game. We all have to work. So living for the game means going to sleep on a night, thinking about coaching sessions and how you can tweak things and it dominating your whole. I was quite happy to let football into my life 24-7 because I love the game. I still love the game. When you become a manager, it impacts your family life. It has a huge impact on you. It, it, it's, it sort of rears itself in areas that you've never seen before. But the level of commitment to be successful for anybody um, at the Championship, Premier League, international football, it has to be your whole life. Mm. And we all have to work, Gary, and it's, uh, I don't think there's any greater pr- privilege than working in, in professional football, so why not commit mm. and sacrifice to that? Absolutely. Um, just... Moving now, Graham, to a little bit more personal about 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 you, really. Um, and you know, you you won the FA Cup in two thousand and thirteen with Wigan. Would you say that was the highlight of your managerial coaching career to date, or was there anything that beats it at Everton or at Belgium, Gary? Remember, I was uh, I was um, on an ET scheme at Newcastle United, there, and the next thing I know, I'm on a bus going to a semi-final of a World Cup against France, getting a bronze medal in a World Cup, beating England, who I'm I love, I'm a proud Englishman. There's nothing can beat that, even winning an FA Cup. The story behind the FA Cup. Gary is not as glamorous as it seems. I was like you probably guys. I used to wake up on cup final day. I used to get a a bus and a metro to uh, the hair market. There was a program shop. I used to go in there, buy me FA Cup program. I couldn't sleep the night before. Get home. It was just such an occasion. Fast forward 20 years. The next thing I know, I'm assistant manager in an FA Cup final against Manchester City. So... I've got to be dead honest with you. If you think about that City team of uh, Aguero, Tevez, Nasri, Silva, Yaya Toure, Gareth Barry, company, my first thoughts is let's not get embarrassed here. We've done incredible to get to this final at Wigan Athletic. But then as the game goes and it grows, all of a sudden you think we're still in this. We've got a chance here. Now fast forward, Gary, we'll, we'll win the game. And you're on the you're on the pitch at Wembley. Now it was pouring a rain, which is not how I used to say the cup final finish. It was uh two weeks before the end of the season, because it was one of the two cup finals played before the end of the season. And it was an incredible feeling. I've got to tell you that. We got in the dressing room. And the next words from Dave Whelan, myself and Roberto was, lads, we're playing on Tuesday at the Emirates against Arsenal, where we had to win, Gary, to stay in the Premier League. Let's look after ourselves, no alcohol. Let's get back on the bus. We had all had a, a Domino's pizza that we'd all picked waiting for. And we drove five hours on the coach back to Wigan. And that was the reality of of the FA Cup final, nothing like I'd, like I'd uh, envisaged growing up or even getting there. But it's only now you look back in hindsight and you realise you've won an FA Cup with Wigan Athletic with the greatest respect of Wigan. We beat the big boys that season and won an FA Cup, which is incredible. Uh, one I'm really, really proud of um, and contributed to. But... I don't think anything anything would take away the World Cup experience, Gary. It's just 
you just you just you know you're working you're totally professional you you're there on merit but there's a moment and you're on that coach and you're traveling to a semi-final in St. Petersburg you're thinking how the hell have I got here and that's the truth mm. yeah and we'll touch a little bit more on the Belgium experience shortly um the type of work what type of work um would you be delivering um, at Everton compared to, say, what you'd be delivering at Belgium? How does it differ, or does it not differ? Uh, it doesn't differ, Gary. It doesn't differ when I was at Luton, at West Brom, at Bournemouth. It's your standards are your standards. The biggest thing in football is is maintaining your standards no matter what the situation is. Believe me, we were bottom of the Premier League for months at Wigan. And the standards had to be the same because it only mattered where you, where we were when you finished the season. So I learned that. I think from mine and Roberto's point of view, we grew. So we started at Swansea, which is a big club. And then we went to Wigan in the Premier League, which was a different experience. And then we had Everton. Don't forget, you're going to Everton and you're working with um, Leighton Baines, Phil Jagielka, Ross Barkley, all England nationals, working with... Romelu Lukaku, uh, Kevin Morales, Belgium international, Sylvain Distan, Stephen Pino, who's a legend in South Africa, um, Seamus Comey, you work Gareth Barry, you're working with some top professionals there. There, you you had to be at you had to be at it, you had to be on your game. Because believe me, if you weren't on your game, they'd let you know about it. Mm-hmm. Standards would had been set to Swansea City, I don't know, five years earlier. We were four, six years earlier. We were, we made a pact, me and Roberto. The, as soon as we went in, we went in at the end of February and we said, let's not repeat an exercise for 10 weeks. And we ended up, we ended up like that for about five years. Tried never to repeat an exercise, tried a different way of doing things. Kept looking back, kept players stimulated, kept people um, enthusiastic about training. It was a huge, uh, it was a huge um, part of playing our success, uh, what we did on the training ground. So at Everton, we 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 didn't change massively. We just were better because we got stimulated by better players. The mm-hmm. higher you go, um, but I remember the I remember the the sessions being outstanding. I've got every copy of the our first full season at Everton when we got seventy two points. In the Premier League, and, and uh, it's fascinating look back, looking back on them because you're really proud of your work at that time. You fast forward seven years, you think, "My God, was I doing that session there?" Just the game evolves, Gary. I never stops. Mm-hmm. Still. And and did you think that was that was a success for you keeping keeping the practices, um, changing the practices to keep the players stimulated and engaged? Did that work for you? And, and um, without a doubt, it was right. it was part of the method of work. Uh, at the beginning, we played differently everybody else, as we were the first side in the country playing out from the back. This is way back in two thousand and seven. We're playing out from the back. Everybody else is launching it. We're playing. We're we're using possession football, um, trying to break uh, teams down with the ball. We try to get a thousand passes in games. Then training was training was different every single day. It was always with the ball. We wouldn't do any running at all without the ball. We'd play 1v1s and everything. Our fitness work came from small-sided games. And that method of work just evolved through the years. Tactically, we're different. Everybody else would try to play different shapes. And, um, you know, that was just a small part in that method of work that worked for us for a long, long time. And... uh... Linking into the next question and the the, the FAS plan do review model. Um, how important is, I mean, you have virtually answered the question there, but how important is that to you and how has that supported you within your coaching experiences? Sorry, I think you do that automatically without putting a label on it, you know? Yeah. I, I just, you know, you, I've told you the detail I've gone in, I go into the plan to do then the do is so important you get that bit right on the on the training ground which is a 
brilliant challenge. I love that challenge. And then you're constantly re reviewing. Yeah. Reviewing never stops. Yeah. Um, so I know the FA have put it in a category. I think it's just something that I've, you know, we've worked, I've worked like that for a long, long time. Comes naturally. Yeah, yeah I don't know just know the process. Yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously, you've mentioned that the, the, the evolving game and the different challenges now to when you played. What, how is the, you know, it's, a, it's definitely a player centred approach now out there on the, on the training pitch out in the 90 minutes. Um, have you got any good experiences, examples of dealing with the individual and supporting the individual and, and what their needs are when you're out there training on the grass? Uh, Lord Scurry, yeah. Um, but you need to constantly remind players it's not a game of tennis here. It's, they're not individuals. It's it's a team game. There's, again, the modern player, all, they all want to work individually, but the, the, the key is the group. Um, but I've had, you know, a huge... I can give you one or two stories, Gary. We we signed a player. Uh, this is how you can really undervalue, uh, really undervalue trying to improve somebody. So we signed a player after our first season in the Premier League with Wigan, a guy called Mauro Baselli. He he. We signed him from Estudiantes in Argentina. We paid six million pounds. It was a club record fee at that time. Mauro was probably as good a goal scorer as I've ever worked with, but wasn't the quickest and struggled in the Premier League. So he went out on loan in Italy, I think in the January, uh, went to Mexico for a season, but he'd obviously signed a four or five year contract with Wigan. He came back in the third season and um, I remember Roberto saying to me one day, Graham, you're going to have to do some individual work with Mauro. We've got to make this work. He's our signing. Okay. My third thoughts there was, Rob, it's nearly impossible to improve this guy's speed. So I says, okay, I knew where he was coming from. So you're thinking, if I can just improve this guy 5%, 5%. So I, I did a program with him, uh, a power, improving power, speed, and finishing uh, um, program. I did uh, two afternoons a week for 10 weeks. Okay. So this is now maybe middle of October. So this program, Gary, goes it goes November, December, into January. So we're now in the 2013 season. We draw Bournemouth in the FA Cup. We draw 1-1 one, one at home. And we are we have to go to Bournemouth in an FA Cup replay. And Rob's gonna play Baselli. Okay. So done this work with him for 10 weeks. There's been moments I'm thinking, has he improved? You don't know. I can't see it subjectively. We win the game 1-0. Mauro Baselli gets a yard in front of a defender and scores. Arta Boric got a hand on it. I think it was Boric got a hand on it. Just goes over the line. We win the game 1-0. Had a barrage down there. End up winning the game 1-0. We then went on sub subsequently to win the FA Cup and then got the move to Everton off the back of it. So people can ignore small detail. I see a lot of I see a lot of lazy coaches who make quick assumptions of people they're not good enough. We need to get somebody else in, we need to spend some money, we need to no, your job is to improve everybody you've got. And the smallest of detail there won us an FA Cup. And I'm certain of that program helped. Certain of it. And then my time at Everton, um, this 19-year-old guy walks in. Um, I remember putting the first training session on with him. I did this sort of ladders, back to go play. He would come round for a second phase on a cross. And uh, it was uh, Lukaku. And 19 he was. We just took him on loan. He says to me, I get called Bonner, Gary. It's a nickname I've had all my life. He says, Bonner, enjoyed that. It was good, that. So Roberto says to him, he is your personal attacking coach. Anything you need, Bonner is your man. Okay? So, obviously, I'm analysing Rom. Rom is a raw product to what he is now. 
I'm analysing Rom. Rom can't receive the ball with his back to goal very well. So put on a programme for him. Me on my own for the first season, and I'm seeing no progress at all. I'm thinking, my God, Rom, we're back to goal. All this work I'm doing, we're not getting anywhere. Second season comes, halfway through, we appoint Duncan Ferguson as first team coach. So you've got me and Big Dunks working with Rom every day. And uh, Duncan's the defender. And obviously I'm serving and we're trying to work on Rom's back to goal play. And we can see a slight improvement. All of a sudden he's retaining possession for one. We signed Samuel Etu that summer. And we're working with, I'm working with, me and Duncan, I'm working with Etu and Lukaku. And Samuel Etu would go in as a defender against Lukaku and work with him. Use his experience, trying to help a young 19 year old as a healthy professional. And then I seen his, and we've seen huge improvements in his game. But it wasn't just one person. I started the process, there was other influences. Then I seen his, his game the other night. Ron's 27 now. That took eight years to get to that mm. level of where he, he's reliable with his back to go. And I was quite. Uh, proud to see his performance, knowing that he played a part in it. Obviously, I worked with him for three years at Everton and two years at, at Belgium as well. But it doesn't come overnight, Gary. It yeah. takes a long time and a lot of practice and the right time, the right environment, the right maturity, the right manager. So it's a you know it's a it, it can be a long working process. Yeah, and I think again going back to the audience on tonight, it's, you've got to be patient with players, haven't you? especially young players that you, you've mentioned, a 19-year-old young professional. Uh, some people will be working with grassroots players and you've got to be patient uh, and work with them to develop them for, for the long term. Yeah, but you, well, Gary, I was a, I was a back-to-goal centre-forward and I was reasonably good at it. Ron was never going to receive the ball the way I did and play the way I did and got me backside in and and use me hips, and he was a very, very different striker. So we all made the mistake of, look, this is how I did it. The key to coaching mm -hmm. is analysing the product and trying to get the best out of that product in his way. I'm not trying to change him. That's over coaching, trying to change people. It's to, you need to harbour and nurture his talent and try and improve him. And there's many, many different ways you can go about it. And you've got to keep trying until you find a formula where it clicks. And with him, it did. Fantastic. Yeah, great. Great point, Graham. Um, flipping that on its head then, Graham, uh, we had a couple of, uh, a few questions in, in and around uh, this. Is When you go into a club, um, how do you motivate long-serving players? So you've got someone that's been there for a few years, um, might not be buying into what you're trying to do. Yeah. How do you get them on side? Someone called them Mavericks. Yeah, I've <laughs> loads, loads of them, Gary. I just, so how Gary, do you deal with them? It's Maybe it's my personality. I just always go in quite naively, never have a, a preconceived idea of people. I want to take them at face value. I want to form my own opinion through my own relationship with them. And then deal with it if you need to deal with it. In terms of, I can think, I can think of one who, uh, you know, re, re, uh, remain you're not uh, anonymous. Yeah. Uh, that I went in um, not so long ago actually, and just told him straight. And I think the older you get, and he's responded to that incredibly well. Just had a straight conversation. Sometimes the higher you go, the, the, the more frightened people are of having a straight conversation. And that's actually what they want. But uh, then there's the secret ones that pretend to be on your side and the assessing your style of play, whether it suits them or not. And you just need to be aware, Gary. Again, it, mm. it comes from experience. I can think of... I can think of... Can you imagine going in Everton after 13 years, you know, 11 years of David Moyes, who did a phenomenal job and you're probably inheriting a group of players that have been there as long. Can you imagine what that's like? Mm. Just If we're just talking about a working week, never mind the style of play, if you change the working week, there was there was an opinion. So never mind tactics, style of play. You know, we 
we uh, we constantly had to deal with that. I think that's part of the job. It's I always think our style, our style, mine and Rob's style. I always think that it's it's the best style, so you'll get people on board in the end. You don't, it's the truth, but the majority you do. Mm. Your transformation from going uh, predominantly as a first team coach working alongside Rob, um, leaving the best team in the world, yeah, to go to be first team manager. Yeah. What was that like? What made you make that decision, Graham? Well, uh, Gary, we, uh, I was uh, I wasn't first team coach with them. I was assistant manager, and there's a huge difference. Um, and I wasn't a, I wasn't an assistant manager who let them get on with it. I was a system manager who was hands on, and I felt every defeat. Um, I felt every defeat like him. Um, so then to go to to work for with with him with Belgium was no different. You didn't want to. I don't like losing football matches. That's the motivation, and winning them is fantastic. But I'm more motivated not to lose football matches. Um, the reason I moved on was because I wanted to be a manager. And there's, it's as straightforward as that. I get loads of people saying, why did you leave Rob? And I left because I wanted to be a manager. I had my own ambition. I'd been offered some good jobs. I'd been offered Swansea in the Premier League. I'd been offered Swansea twice in the Championship. I'd been offered some Huddersfield. I'd been offered England in the 21s job. I'd been offered some really, really good jobs. And I just got to a point where I went, I need to, I need to go and do what I want to do in my life here. It's like I've committed to 13 years with Rob as part of a partnership. I never once rocked that in terms of leaving. Uh, and I got to a point at 48 year old where I, I needed to go and I needed to go and have a go. So that was the biggest reason. Gary, first first team manager was. There's no way anybody could have been better prepared than me. Nobody. Because I was properly hands-on. But even then, it hit, hit you like a brick wall. It, the responsibility hits you like a brick wall. And But I, 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 I wanted that. I wanted that stimulation. In fact, needed that stimulation. For me and Robert, was, and with our relationship, there's only one game in the, in, in the whole world that was bigger than semi-final or the third and fourth place playoff and that's a World Cup final I just felt at that time it had gone as far it was, as it was going to go it was the right time to leave and it was for them reasons so um, yeah and how did it how did it differ Graham so what were the differences from you working alongside Rob to now being your own man um, well I think oh, Initially, Gary, we sort of started slowly at Luton and then picked up and then did okay, actually, September, October, November, and had a really bad December, January. Uh, lost eight, lost eight, drew one. One of them was a 7-0 defeat at Brentford. So all these coaching courses we've all been on, Gary, try and be in, try being 5-0 down at Brentford at half-time. Try walking past your own fans. Try giving a team talk making two substitutions, then a referee giving two penalties. Then in that period, I lost a guy with a hamstring. So I made a third substitution. Then I lost a guy with a patella tendon. We conceded two more goals, got beat 7-0. And there's no coaching course in the mm. world can prepare you for that. Mm. You, you have to do it. And uh, it was a tough, tough period. And in that period, most people get sacked. And my last nine games were for, for Luton were, I think we won four, drew three, lost two. Certainly the last six was won three, drew two, lost one. We had three clean sheets. I'm really proud of that because to turn that around is not easy. When you're suffering, you're getting sick and you're in the middle of something. So the responsibility of being a number one, you can't look anywhere else for help. It lands at your door, lands on your toes. You're the one who has to find solutions. And that was probably the biggest change from being a, an assistant manager to, to going to become an, uh, uh, a manager. And in the end, I thoroughly enjoyed it. 
the process of, of getting there was tough. But Gary, if you start a new job tomorrow, I don't know what the next uh, the next rung of the ladder is for you. you. You'd find it difficult for six months, and then if you're committed to it, you'll eventually get your head around it, and you'll mm-hmm. you'll do okay because life's like that. It's it's about your experiences, but you you've got to be willing to have a go. Is there anything you would change about your time at Luton? I should have concentrated more off the ball, um, definitely. Uh, I'm from a school of winning football matches and dominating with the ball. And I think when you're a newly promoted team, as Wickham have showed and Coventry have showed this season, you need to be a bit more pragmatic. Um, but in the end, I, I, I corrected that and we, we got football results. So it was a good lesson. But that's the beauty, Gary, of football and life. You, as long as you're learning on the way, you, you mm. actually have to go through it fundamentally yeah. in order to improve. So... I loved it, you know, enjoyed enjoyed it in a perverse way every single second because I was ready for it. It's what I wanted. All right, Graham. Uh, we'll, we're just going to move on to your time at Belgium, working with the best team in the in the world at, at this moment in time. Um, how did you find the, the, the difference um, and the challenges of working within international football from... Um, working on a daily basis, as you had done for 15 years, um, to working with the lads, you know, every three months. What was that like as a coach? Um, whew, what was it like? Um, well, firstly, Gary, me and Roberto went to live in Belgium. So I lived there for two years. We both lived in Waterloo in Belgium. He still, obviously still lives there now. So... That was the first the first decision we got right, which was to go and experience the culture, uh, understand the culture, because that country is made up of uh, Flemish, French and German speakers. Um, so it's not straightforward, let's put it like that. Um, so I think understanding the culture, understanding that the Belgian Pro League is represented by Flemish clubs and French-speaking clubs and uh, one particular club that's in the German uh, speaking area. I think that was essential when I look back, getting the culture. And then, the to my shock, we landed in Brussels airport and we stayed in a hotel, I forget the name of the hotel, in Brussels airport. And we, this is the first camp, I think it was a 12-day camp. We were getting the bus to Andelex training ground every day and then coming back to the hotel and that was our routine for 12 days. So you've got the you've got Eden Hazard, you've got Kevin De Bruyne, you've got Vincent Company, you've got these incredible players who at that time we didn't have our own national training ground, getting bussed at Anderlecht every day. We didn't even have our own pitch uh, to train. Um, and uh, that first 12 days was, was eye-opening, let's put it like that. Um, and then you've got Roberto Martinez, who's the manager. You get automatic respect for you, the manager. Thierry Henry was, uh, I was first first assistant coach. Thierry was second assistant coach. The players all idolised Thierry. So who's Graham Jones from Gateshead? <laughs> so you've really, you know, you, you, you're only going to get your respect from your work. Mm. It's the only way, and that was some yeah. challenge. And again... I could tell you another story that I would say I finally got my respect at half time in the third and fourth place playoff game against England. Well, I let the group know how much it meant to me to get a bronze medal. I think I finally got my that's how that's how tough the challenge was. And boys were very respectful, but you still you've got to earn that. And I did. Over a over a, a long period of time it was Five, you met up five times a year. Like the boys will, the boys will finish tonight. I think the play against Denmark, and they won't coach again, and they won't be won't be with the national team for five months. And that's some gap. And then all of a sudden you're on the training ground, and you forget how to speak, and you forget how to coach, and you forget how to kick a ball. And then you learn in your second season there that you've got to keep yourself active, and, and uh, in terms of kicking footballs and coaching and. So it was, 
it was a it was an incredible experience. Um, and then the biggest thing, guys, was at that time, me and Roberto taking me and Roberto and Terry are taking the sessions. You're working with Guardiola's City, you're working with Mourinho's United, you're working with Conti's Chelsea, uh, you are working with um, Sarri's Napoli, you're working with Klopp's Liverpool. That's the standard of coaching that our players were used to. Mm-hmm. So when they came in, you better be on your metal. Because again, if you weren't, they'd let you know. They had standards that they were used to every day. So you, you quickly realised that there were certain, what would call Team Belgium principles that needed to be there in that, them international weeks. They needed to be there regularly. They needed to be there quickly. We need to remind people that you're not at your club anymore. This is how you play with Belgium. This is how we work. So that was different to how we'd ever worked previously. The, we're still creative in our own way, but it was a bit more fundamental. Fundamentals with our work. Did your session design have to change much from what you'd done in the past? Obviously, you've just mentioned there you, you had to be at the very top of your game. Did your session design change in any way? No. Working with the best players in the world? No, not at all. No. We're, we're, me and Rob had this finishing thing that we still do now in pairs and and he he probably still do it. I've, I still do it. And they loved it. Absolutely loved it. And um, yeah, no, I didn't. Uh, I mean, obviously we were. We'd always work, Gary, and honestly, we're ready for it. Would 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 never drop standards, never mm-hmm. have. And we're ready for it. We didn't. Uh, we didn't change. We. You try to evolve and you try to improve and educate yourself, of course. But um, no, the, the format of the sessions were very similar. And how was he, uh, the legend Thierry Henry, to work with? Uh, Titi's a he's a great lad, Thierry. Guys, very down to earth. Very, very humble, very normal. Uh, he's from a suburb, suburban Paris that's as rough as you'll find. Uh, so he's a tough boy, uh, but with great humility, uh, great respect. Uh, he had uh, fantastic emotional intelligence. He'd been around, great experience. He always stayed in his lane, as he would put it, which is a skill. Um it's a life skill, I think, and uh, I spent I spent majority of my two years with him because he's hyperactive. He can't, he couldn't go in his room and watch the telly. He was me and him were in the gym at seven o'clock in the morning. He was in the canteen for twelve hours a day, playing cards, playing everything, and he's just he was great to be around. Somebody I consider a friend. He's he's a proper lad, you know, mm. and, uh, but elite. He knew what it was like. He knew what it took to win. Definitely improve that uh, aspect. I wouldn't settle for mediocrity with anybody. Um, so, from, from a coaching point of view, Graham, did he uh, did he bring a lot to the to the squad to the environment that we talk about? Yeah, uh, was that, he still learning? Obviously, still learning because he's well, new to this. He, he was learning, Gary. I think it was his. He'd worked at Arsenal youth team for a year. And then he came in with us as a, a, a second assistant. Well, uh, I, I would take defensive set players, some uh, attacking player. Thierry would be involved in that. He would take attacking set players, very creative. Um, had a, had different sessions, uh, but his knowledge was incredible, incredible. His knowledge, just his aura and his presence, but mm. very very capable coach and. Um, somebody definitely added added our group um, because again it was it was just me and Rob. I would add Richard Evans who had been with us since our time at Swansea. Uh, he's a it was a sports scientist, so it was Terry added a really nice compliment. What would you say was your biggest challenge in Belgium, Graham? The biggest challenge, yeah. Mm-hmm. Biggest challenge, Gary. Oh. Did you have to uh, speak the language? No. No. Um, the the previous manager was French speaking, so I think it maybe 
uh, rubbed the Flemish speakers up the wrong way. So right from minute one, it was we all agreed to, that we we're going to speak in English, mm-hmm. and that was quite neutral. Um, they're all they're all playing in the Premier League anyway. Um, biggest challenge for me, I mean, I love Marouane Fellaini, but he would all Marouane would always try it on if you let him. And I'd worked with Marouane at Everton, and I remember it was it was a fight, Marouane, and me and him ended up really close in the end because you work and how you are as a person, you I won won that kind of respect from uh, from from him. Um, so. Just a challenge of the group, really. Just, but nothing, Gary, that I'd say to you, or, you know, that was a bad moment or whatever. It was just, I'll never ever get a tougher job in my career than working with them players because mm. you've got these huge stars with, uh, I wouldn't, yeah, big, big egos, but not, not ugly egos, but big egos because they're, they're, they're huge stars all in the same group. So, uh, to manage that, even in a eight, eight, eight against two, ten by ten box, is not straightforward. Emotionally, you, you need to be intelligent in order to get your get your understanding right, get your empathy right, get your rules right. It's it's hard to explain. It was a mm-hmm. it was a, 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 a brilliant test, but one one I loved. It was you know, Gary, the, away from the the five camps a year. I'm, I'm traveling all over Europe watching the best games in the world and the best seats in the house, scouting our Belgian players playing Champions League semi finals and and finals. It was a phenomenal job. It's just it was just an absolute pleasure. Not a bad job, Graham. <laughs> what was uh, what was it like then? Beating England and uh, what sort of planning went into that? Um well oh, uh <laughs> The group game, Gary, was mad because, like, you we've promoted winners from minute one. We needed a win. We had a golden generation. We needed a win, and that's all we ever spoke about. So everybody could see that if you lost to England, that the route to the final was a lot more straightforward than than if you won. So it was one of the strangest games. I think I've been involved in three games of football in my life where I knew. That if it went either way, <laughs> it wouldn't be too bad. That was one of them. But I think only Adnan Janazai didn't didn't realise that was a better route to. <laughs> so that was strange, Gary. It was strange. He and the national anthem. I'm a proud Englishman. Uh, the only team I ever supported after Newcastle United was where I grew up. When I started competing against Newcastle was England, and then that went out the window. All of a sudden, we're competing against them. I did my pro license with Gareth. I know Gareth really, really well, and uh, really mixed emotions that day uh, in Kaliningrad. Really mixed emotions, but um, beating them was a strange feeling because I was thinking more about bloody hell we're on that side of the draw now. But the third and fourth place playoff, uh, Gary, that game was for me. It was massive. I wanted a medal. Um, Sometimes your own personal league can be motivation for everybody. It's the 15th of July. These boys have been going at it since probably the previous 1st of July. And one more game, we've got to, got to win. I want, I've want i got a bronze medal at home. I want, you get nothing for fourth place. And my job was set, set players against. And again, I contributed massively because we didn't concede in both games. Now, England scored against every other team in the World Cup from set players. And we kept a clean sheet twice, which helps you. It helps you get a get a bronze medal. Um, but here in the national anthem for me was one of the toughest things. I just wanted to sing. I felt proud to be in that moment. And obviously, you can't. You got to be. Res- you got to be respectful. You got to be professional. It was the same for Thierry in the the semi final, and they, they we played France. He had the, you know, he's he's France's all time record goal scorer and. It's just being professional, Gary. You've got to get into that mm. into that state of mind. The last one on the on the Belgium side, Graham. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot around the the English game, the FA on small sided 
games at foundation phase level. Yeah. Uh, and Belgium do a lot with uh, in their foundation phase with the, with the smaller groups, even smaller than five e five two v two. Yeah. Sort of two v two stuff. Did you see any sort of development of that when you were out in Belgium? That's bringing the technical players through within the game. Um, not really, Gary. If I'm being honest, we used to have coaches meetings in uh, the federation in Brussels. Uh, I forget the name of the the guy now, Bob. Bob, I forget his surname, Bob. But he was he was the he was the guy who introduced all that to Belgian football, and he's played a huge part in um, the development of the, the of the the players that have come through now. Um, and the 2v2 and the 1v1 was was something that we believed in. We've always worked that way um, right throughout the years. That was part of our method as well. So, um, yeah, I know that's 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 big with the younger age group still. Um, and again, I think it was already there, but we were we certainly uh, helped for that to stay there as well because we're you know big believers in it. Yeah, good stuff. Um, Graham, I'm conscious of time. I haven't gotten through all the questions yet. Helen, is there anything that's come through on the chat that um, you want to mention? Um, there was a one, um, a one here from um, from Michael Johnson. Um, he says, Graham, you've spoken about going from club to club. What's the transition of going from managing a college team like you did to assistant manager coaching a first team professional club? Well, the the college team, uh, Gary, is the only bit I really missed, and it was pivotal actually. Um, when I was finishing playing, so I was thirty four. I was at Bosnia United in League Two, and I applied for the head coach's job at Darlington College of Technology. So, with my uh, cert ed in teaching, um, I could teach one day a week and coach four days a week, full time. I then managed to play part-time, but in the league with Berry, with Hamilton and with Clyde for two more years and work in Middlesbrough Academy. So we're talking about three jobs. I was working seven days a week. That job at Darlington College was, was we were recruiting all the 16-year-olds that Middlesbrough, Darlington, Hartlepool, Newcastle, Sunderland didn't, didn't uh, think were good enough. Like the job you did at Gateshead. And... Um, Managed to, me personally, made tons of mistakes, experimented for fun. Uh, for me, it wasn't about winning. Gary, it wasn't. It was about uh, playing out from the back. At that time, this is before I met Roberto, eh? this is two, 2004, five and six. Andy Toman, Paul Bryson, Gates of, who, uh, Bryson was at Gates of College, they'll all vouch for that, that. I think they beat us regular, but I kept trying to play this way of learning and development. And uh, I think that when I look back, it stood me in really good stead. I remember being 2-0 up and putting uh, putting two forwards on the pitch rather than rather than defending to try and see out the result. And I just kept experimenting with it. And it was a really good learning phase for me, that. Um, and one I used to the max, really. And to go from that into first team being a first team manager it's just you you don't go from being Darlington College's head coach to Luton manager in the championship there's a process that you go through to prepare you for that that was the start of the process at Darlington College and one that I'm like and Middlesbrough Academy one that I'm was fundamental to where I am today anything else Helen um I think there was one from Ben around um, around really the, the process, which I think you've probably covered about um, about you know the transition from work and day to day in club football to international football. Um, ben says you know he's not really aware of any education process to support that, and I think you've explained how how you kind of had to just feel your way with that really. Yeah, it's just I'm that type of person, Helen. You know, just like I said, probably being naive is a great strength. I just get on with it and see what happens. Just be ready for it, be adaptable, be flexible. And it was different, but we'd had seven years straight in the Premier League, me and Roberto, I think it was 265 games straight. 
no break in seven years. And when that job came around, the, the flip side of that is we were ready for it because it allowed us to uh, analyze our method of work, uh, Gary, which was would been in place for 10 years at that point. So we, we spent time analyzing our method of work and trying to improve in different areas. And uh, it was a it was a big, big period in our lives to try and to try and use it to get better. Graham, has there, has there been any light bulb moments within your co coaching journey that's made you evaluate your beliefs and values? Have you um, stuck to what you believe in right the way through your career? Gary, you, you get tested there. You, you, you're constantly getting tested. Um, but if, if you talk about a, a light bulb moment, a light bulb moment, I remember... I remember seeing Dave Parnaby coach for the first time at Middlesbrough. And even to this day, Dave's, Dave Parnaby's everything a coach should aspire to look like and be and behave. And when I seen his style and I saw his manner and then I saw his knowledge and his coaching ability, he just demonstrated to me what a coach should look like. And I've never really lost that example. It's only now you realise, obviously, Dave's a lot further down the ladder than you are in terms of experience and he's in a position where he can he can improve his knowledge because of the environment he's working in but he just he was just a great example for me of what I wanted to become and uh, I've never really lost that he's still he's still in the forefront of my thoughts of what a coach should look like mm. um conscious of time Graham and we're nearly through the 90 minutes. Um, another really good question that, that, that's come up. Um, if you drew Liverpool this season in the Cup, um, how would you set up and what would that week look like in working with the players to play against a team like Liverpool, like Man City? <clears throat> Hopefully I'd be ill, Gary, and miss it. <laughs> <laughs> because I mean Liverpool are different this season than what they were last year. Obviously, again, injuries injuries dictate that. How would you set it up? Well, the working week, Gary, I don't want to bore people there, but the first thing you need to do is analyse yourself and then you need to analyse the opposition in detail. The one thing I'd say to you now, if I was setting up against Liverpool, I would pick eleven physically capable players. That would be the first criteria. Because unless you can compete with them physically, you've got no chance of competing with them technically or tactically. So that would be the biggest thing. And that would be players who are, one, physically capable, and two, that are match fit. So then, obviously, you'd go about working off the ball. Then you'd have to have a, a period where you try and work on the ball, where you can hurt them. Because you, the one thing about teams I've been involved in, Gary, I've always wanted to punch the opposition on the chin. Never, ever sit back and just be on the ropes. You just, it's a matter of time. Always want to punch the opposition on the chin. And when you do that, you have to take a few little risks. And when you do that, it can change dynamics in football matches. I don't see enough teams that play Liverpool that try to do that. The, the answer is always two banks of four or four, five, one, and try and see the game out. So it would be that kind of preparation, that kind of, them kind of thoughts towards trying to go and be competitive, uh, playing against these, these teams. We, we played Man City not so long ago, what, six weeks ago in the Carabao. And, um, you know, it's, if you try and work out, I went to watch Man City at Wolves on their opening day of the uh, game of the season in preparation for our game in the Carabao. If you try and work out every pattern of play that Manchester City have got and then try and show your players it and then work on it, we had four, three days to work on it. You would, you would, you would uh, you wouldn't achieve it, so you have to try and get something blanket that would cover that would cover it in general, but always with with the um, the thought that we're going to punch you on the chin at some point. And uh, but I mean you know two totally different styles and two teams, but just right at the top end of the game. Thanks for that, Graham. Um, Graham, I could listen to you all night. So this could go on for uh, 
a long term yet, but I'm, I'm, as I say, I'm conscious of that 90 minutes coming up. Um, okay. First first of all, can I thank everyone for who's joined us tonight uh, to be a part of this really insightful, uh, interesting, knowledgeable journey of yours, Graham, uh, and, and for passing on the questions that I've that I've given to you because without people engaging, coaches engaging, um, we couldn't have had this conversation. Um, and last of all to you, basically for giving up your time, uh, such a busy period, um, and good luck for the rest of the season. And hopefully you'll get promotion and get back in that, that Premier League, Graham. Well, that, that's the plan, Gary, and I, I thank you uh, because it's it's probably the first time I've been able to give a little something back, Gary, because as I said to you, I started with Northumberland FA when I was 19. So if there's any young coach out there uh, in the same shoes I was in, that you just have to believe that anything anything's possible. And I can't give them any insight into do it this way, do it that way. Just believe that anything's possible and do it your way. And as I said, you can achieve anything. So I'm grateful, Gary, for tonight. Uh, hopefully I've helped uh, some aspiring coaches out there. Um, mine's only one way. It doesn't mean to say it's the right way. It's just it's just been one way of doing things. So anytime, Gary, in the future, if anybody needs any help, then just let me know. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Graham, and good night to everyone.